Man, we've already had a full full service already. Uh, but but today I wanna I wanna talk about we're in the series in the in the book of Acts and uh, uh, I mean the book of Acts the book of Luke. Uh, Acts was last year, so we're we're in the we're in the we're in the uh, 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 the Gospel of Luke. And today I want to uh, talk about a message called "Called, Chosen, and Faithful." But but before that, I just want to let you guys know that that what we're experiencing here is is just some supernatural. You know what I mean? Stuff. We're 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 not we're not waiting on an awakening. We are an awakening. We're not waiting on revival. This is revival. It's here and it's coming. You know what? You know this this past uh, 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 this past week, I'm at Mardi Gras. I go to Mardi Gras. You know what I mean? Because I went over there to, to get people saved. Some of y'all were like, what was Pastor doing at Mardi Gras? We were going over there to pray over people. But also we went over there to, uh, to see about bringing a, a, a Bible college back here. Soon Bible college. So we're going to start a, we're gonna start a Bible college in the building right here. We're going to have a youth center. And we're going to have a Bible college where you can get bachelor's degrees. Come on. You can get a bachelor's degree. So one of the people that we're thinking about doing it through is Soon Bible College out of, uh, uh, they're actually out of Sacramento and Oakland, but they also have a campus in New Orleans. So that's what we were down there uh, doing. And, and, and I took, me and Zach went, took Zach down there with me because Mardi Gras, they can get crazy. I figured I need to take Zach with me to make sure if people leave me alone. But we went over there, and, and uh, uh, but while when I was on the plane and, and we had landed, I, I ended up getting that first night. I got we got a message from a young lady uh, uh, from a lady that works at I Poor Life, and she had said that hey, you know what? And, and Julie, Julie and Paul Higgins are here today. What's up, Julie and Paul Higgins, the the directors of I Poor Life? And so, but so this is what happened. This young lady sends a message, but last year. Uh, uh, Jeremy Alvarez had called me and me and, and Hannah and asked if we could go pray over this young lady, you know what I mean, and be with her because she was going through some stuff, you know what I mean, she was, you know, all kinds of demonic uh, oppression was happening, and I was like, it sounds like she's demonized Jeremy, and he's like, could you go stay with her till I can get into town, so we walk up on this, on this front porch right here, right here, not, not too far away from here, walk up on the porch, and uh, you know what I mean? The, this young lady was demonized. You know what I mean? I, I won't go into all the details of that. You know what I mean? But anyway, we prayed for her. You know what I mean? She was set free, kind of set free. And then the next day, Jeremy called and said, you know, there's some weird stuff happening. And I said, bring her to Friday Night Fire. So they brought her. My mom, that was actually the last time my mom was here. So my mom was here too. I said, bring her to Friday Night Fire. We prayed for her. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, she didn't want to stay for service, but but anyway, that was the last we saw of her until we got a message a few days ago, and, and the, young, the, the young lady had sent a, a message to Sean, and she had said, hey, you know, uh, uh, where's my phone at? That's probably easier. I could just read it. But uh, she said, uh, uh, so the, the young lady sent a, sent a message, and she was here on Friday. She might even be here this morning, but uh, uh, so she sent a message saying, that, uh, you know, that she had, uh, what's wrong with this Wi-Fi? <laughs> this isn't the time. Uh, so what, what, yeah, so this young lady, this young lady said, hey, you know what? Uh, I was out, I had, uh, uh, I had often thought about what happened when I was uh, with Pastor John and Hannah, and I ended up, Ending up at a, a Farmington at the at the psych ward, and while I was there, I had a dream. I had a dream about the about Pastor John's church, and um, and then she said, uh, "Okay, here it is." <laughs> no, <laughs> forget it. You know what I mean. So what happened was she said, "You know." But anyway, we were out blunt cruising, and if you don't know what that is, we were out. You know what I mean, Rid riding, riding around and, and, and smoking weed. How many know what blunt cruising is? How many have ever been blunt cruising? Oh, my gosh. And so, and so what, happened, what happened was they were, they were riding around, and, and, and they had the windows rolled up, and the windows of the driver was like just a crack. 
her window was closed. The other person had their window open a crack, and she said that everything went quiet in the whole in the whole car. It felt like she was the only person in the world. She couldn't hear a thing, couldn't hear the cars, felt like she was alone in the room. Everything got completely quiet. And then she said that she began to think about the dream she had about City Reach Springfield when she was in Farmington. She began to think about the time when, when me and Hannah and Amber and the team were praying with her in the back. And, and she began to think about City Reach Springfield. Then all of a sudden, what ended up happening is a, a, a piece of paper flew in the window, a crack that big, flew Flew in the window, landed in her hoodie, and then she grabbed it, grabbed the piece of paper out of her hoodie, and what was it? Kids That's the kids' right car. You can't make this stuff up. God, God is on the move. We had another young man, so that happened the very the very next day. A young man sent a message to our Facebook page. He goes, I go to another church here in town. He goes, but I had a dream that I was standing in front of the stage at City Reach Springfield in a, in a military uniform and that I was saluting and I was looking up at Pastor John and then behind the pastor was, was, a, was a sign that said, you are chosen. He said, he said, needless to say, I'll see you at church on Sunday. Come on. So, and I believe they said he's here today. But, but, but so, so, man, God is on the move. He is drawing together an army for these last days to take this city, to take this region for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. And, and you know what? I, I, I'm seeing stuff that I've only prayed about. I've prayed for spirit of conviction of sin, spirit of repentance of sins to fall upon people for years because I was a student. When I first met Jesus, I was a student of revival. I studied, I read every possible thing that you could about moves of God. You know, the Hebrides revival, Azusa Street revival, Welsh revival, the, the, the prayer revival. Every awake, I would, I would read about them, but the things that I saw in there, I wasn't seeing in, 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 in my life, and I wanted to see it. That people would, you know, just encounter God just by you walking in the room and people give their lives to Jesus Christ. But watch this. You know what I mean? So me and Zach are down at Mardi Gras. And, and Zach's used to witnessing in North Springfield. He's not really, he's not really used to Mardi Gras. You know what I'm saying? And he didn't even know it was Mardi Gras. He's like, man, these people here are crazy. You know what I mean? But, I mean, you know, if you know anything about Mardi Gras, I mean, there are people naked. There's some crazy madness going on there. You know what I mean? And so he, but, but he's walking through like, God bless you. God bless you, sister. God bless you. And, th and they're like, F you. You know what I mean? And he's like, God bless you. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, and, he's, and, he's, and, he, and he's got City Reach Springfield flyers. And I'm like, you know, and he's all, hey, just watch us on the website. Just watch us on the website. But you know what? We ran into three people that are, that, that are actually from Springfield. You know what I mean? So pr pretty amazing, man. But uh, 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 so so. Uh, but he, uh, we're standing on the street corner on Bourbon Street right there, and Zach, Zach is actually, you know, I'm talking to a pastor from Florida. Zach asked these two ladies walking by, "Do you know Jesus?" They begin to break down and cry. You know what I mean? Hunched over, weeping and weeping and weeping. And I look over at Zach, and Zach's like, "What do I do?" <laughs> I don't know. Haven't, haven't had this happen. You know what I mean? So we go over, and, and honestly, what I thought was, I thought they were faking it. I thought they were mocking us. You know what I mean? So I walked right up to the young ladies, and I mean tears. I mean just makeup falling. You know what I mean? Just breaking down. I said, what do you feel right now? And the one girl was a backslidden Christian, 23-year-old girl. She goes, conviction. And she was trembling. You know what I mean? Under the power of God. It was supernatural. So I'm like... Well, let's lead them to Jesus. You know what I mean? So we, we just had them, get, you know, uh, 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 you know, you know, say the prayer. I mean, and they were just like weeping. It wouldn't go away. So what we're experiencing right now, you know what I mean, is going to increase. What we're, what we're experiencing right now is the beginning of an awakening. This is the beginning of an awakening. And so I'm just excited to see what God is going to do. So who do we serve? Jesus. And what do we do? Come on. So right now in Luke chapter 6, the passage that, that is mine this morning is Luke chapter 6, 12 through 16. And what this passage talks about is that, you know what I mean, Jesus spent all night in prayer. You know, and, and, and then, then he called the disciples to himself. You know what I mean? And out of those disciples, he appointed 12 to be apostles, right? 
And so these weren't the, the type of leaders that Jesus chose. They didn't have the Fortune 500, you know, headhunters out looking for them like to try to hire them. You know what I mean? That wasn't what was going on here. You know what I mean? Jesus was calling the unlikely people. You know what I mean? And he chose 12 of them, you know what I mean, to, to, be, to be the apostles. And you know what? God doesn't qualify, doesn't, qual, doesn't call the qualified how many know he qualifies the called? You know what I mean? And, and, and some of us in this, in this place today, God's raising us up. Man, God met me when I was in a lonely prison cell in Santa Fe, New Mexico, in solitary confinement. He called me, he appointed me, and he raised me up. And so it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter if you were a crackhead, gang member, prostitute. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter your background. It matters what God has called you to. Come on, somebody. And so what you need to do is you just need to, you need to let the devil know that, that you might know a lot about my history, but you don't know nothing about my destiny. Come on, somebody. And in Revelation 17, 14, it says, They will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and with Him are the called, chosen, and faithful followers. Come on. So there's three levels, called, chosen, and faithful. We are all called unto salvation because Jesus died on the cross. You know what I mean? He loved the world so that all may be saved, but only those who submit and believe actually are saved, and he gives them the power to become sons and daughters of God. And then, and then those, that are, those that are chosen are the ones that show themselves worthy of the kingdom. The Bible says no one puts their hand to the plow and looks back because if they do, they're not worthy of the kingdom. And then those that are faithful are the ones that have, have, have been through the battle and stood standing. They're the ones that have been through the trials, have been through the persecution, but they're still standing after all that. That's why the Bible says, be careful. Be, don't be hasty to lay hands on someone that, that, that it hasn't be, doesn't have maturity, hasn't been walking with the Lord for many years and been through a little stuff. Why? Because they haven't been tested. We, want, we need to be tested, and then you're proving that you're faithful. If you ain't never been through nothing, we don't know whether you're faithful or not. That's why, that's why at the Hope Homes, we raise up resident leaders. You know what I mean? Because it's a controlled environment where we can see, you know, it's sink or swim. And if they start to sink, remove the, remove the title, but they're still in a, in a protective place. You know what I mean? But you got to be careful not to raise up people that are too young in the Lord. But you will get people that have been saved maybe a year or two. They're ready to run the church. They're ready to tell pastor how to do everything. They're ready to take over the men's home. They're ready to raise a half a million dollar budget a year to keep things, things, things open. But see, bigger levels, bigger devils. You know what I mean? You conquer the place where you're at, and then God will raise you up. I remember 20 years ago, I'm sitting right there where you are, Marvin. I'm sitting right where you are, right where you guys are sitting, you know what I mean, in a recovery home on the run for attempted murder and, and, and kicking and, 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 and just getting off of heroin. But this is what I want to talk to you today is that, you know what, sometimes God, you know what I mean, doesn't call those people that the world would call. In fact, there was one guy in the book of Acts, and, and he came from a crazy background. Uh, he was even killing Christians, but he ended up being one of, the most, one of the most powerful witnesses for Christ. He took the church of Jesus Christ from a little Jewish sect to a worldwide religion. Where, hey, where, is, my, uh, where is my ox goad? Is my ox go? It was right there. Did someone move it? He caused Christianity to go from a Jewish sect to a worldwide religion. So watch this. The first mention of Saul was in Acts 7.58. And Saul, who became Paul in Acts 13, in Acts 7.15.8, he was there when they dragged out Stephen. When they dragged out Stephen, you know what I mean? They dragged him out. He was the first martyr of the church, and they stoned him to death. Paul was there, you know what I mean, consenting to that. Some people say maybe he ordered it, you know what I mean? But, but, but this man who, who was the biggest per persecutor of the church, the Bible says in Acts chapter 8 and verse 3 that he went everywhere and tried to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. He even went house to house 
The Bible says he dragged out men and women and locked them up and voted for their execution. You know what I mean? So, so how many know that, that in, in, in the days of Paul, in the early church, the women were people to be reckoned with too. The, the, the women were just as dangerous. Come on. Can I get an amen, women? Can I get an amen, women? Let me get a shout, women. Can the women in the house? Ooh. All right. All right. So, 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 so the women were people to be reckoned with. They were locking the women up. And, and ordering that they be killed because they were on fire for Jesus. And, and, and so in Acts chapter 9, we see that, 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 that Paul was going around, you know, locking up and killing Christians. In Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, it says, Then Saul, still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from the synagogue of Damascus. So that if he found any who were of the way, and they called it the way because early, but this was actually a, a, a negative term that, the, that, the, that people called them because they believed that Jesus Christ was the only way to heaven. That he was the way, the truth, and the life. And they said, whether men or women, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And so right here, he's on his, he's on his way to Damascus to lock people up. You know what I mean? And then, and then Jesus appears to Saul in a blinding light. So Paul's headed to Damascus, which is about 140 miles northeast of Jerusalem as a bird flies, as the crow flies. You like that one? They still use that term? So, but uh, I just read it in books. But anyway, 200 miles by road, you know what I mean? So, so he goes up to the powerful persecutor of the church of Jesus Christ. And then in Acts chapter 9, 3 through 5, it reads like this. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone from heaven. He fell to the ground. Everybody say, fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So, so, right, so right here, uh, 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 uh. Uh, 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 Paul, Paul actually, so he rec recognizes that this is, a, this is a light from heaven, so he recognizes that this is probably deity. You know what I mean? A light from heaven, glory of God hits him, he falls to the ground. You know what I mean? So Paul is recognizing that this is probably deity. So he was probably, he was probably walking. Some commentaries say he may have been riding a horse. Right, and, and, and so as soon as that, as soon as the, this encounter with Jesus, the presence of Jesus came, the resurrected Lord met him. He actually fell to the ground. Isn't that amazing? Many times in scriptures we see people fall to the ground when they encounter the presence of God. Why does that happen? I don't know. You know what I mean? We'll ask, we'll ask God when we get to heaven. But sometimes people fall to the ground. But the important thing, and that happens in this church, sometimes people fall to the ground. But it's not the matter of whether or not you fall to the ground. It's not the matter that whether you walk up and say a prayer at the altar call. What is, what is the matter is what are you going to do after you get up? What are you going to do after you answer that altar call? Come on. So, Pastor, where is this in the Bible? John 18, 6 says like this. When, Jesus went, when they went to get Jesus, Jesus was betrayed, and, and, and they came to get him, and they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said, I am he. They drew back, and they fell to the ground like dead men. And Matthew chapter 28, 2 through 4, uh, it talks about when Jesus was resurrected. And it says, there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone, set on it. His appearance was like lightning. Everybody say lightning. lightning. And his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. They began to tremble and fell to the ground. In Revelation 1 7, it says like this, and this is the, the, the this is John, John the John the Apostle. He says, he, he says, uh, 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 oh, that's not it. That's not the one I'm looking for. Is that 1 7? Okay, so 17, I'm sorry. 17. I'll read it to you. When I saw him, he said, I fell, I fell at his feet as though dead, and he placed his right hand upon me and says, Do not be uh, afraid. And so Paul, Paul in, in, in 117 says he fell to the ground when he saw Jesus. And so it's not, but, but as I said before, it's not about falling. You know what I mean? It's about what are you going to do with Jesus? 
What are you going to do with this encounter with God? See, I believe in encounters with Jesus. I believe in encounters. I believe in experiences. I believe Jesus can be known experientially. But it's not just about the experience. It's about what are you going to do after the experience. You know what I mean? What are you going to do when you get up off the ground? What are you going to do after you come out of that room after giving your life to Jesus Christ? Are you going to walk it out? You know what I mean? So we have, over, we, have, we have done a disjustice to the gospel when we tell people you can just say a little prayer. Now you're saved. Go back to doing whatever you was doing before. That's inaccurate. But let, me, but let me tell you something. The Lord met me in solitary confinement at the prison in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and, and he encountered me. I mean, I read my Bible for five months and prayed, and, and God, the presence of God was so tangible in that little solitary confinement. I trembled under the power of God for five months in, in solitary confinement. Wasn't nobody looking you know what I mean? Nobody cared. I mean, I was, in, I was alone. You know what I mean? But you know what? God met me. But you know what? The veracity to that experience right there is that since that day, I haven't stuck a needle in my arm. Since that, come on. Since that day, I haven't carried a gun. Since that day, I haven't had sex with anybody but my beautiful wife. My life was transformed by an experience with Jesus Christ. And I continue to experience Jesus Every day. He's so good. So he said, so he heard a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know what I mean? And God deals with us as, as individuals. He actually used the Hebrew word Saul to talk to Saul right there. He used the Hebrew word and, and he speaks to us as individuals in ways that we can understand. It'll be something weird. You might be like, I feel like God spoke to me through this coincidence like this, and I saw that, and I saw this number, and then this happened, and people will look at you like, you're psychotic. And you're like, no, but God spoke to me. And they're like, okay. Well, you, know, I saw, you know what I saw? Uh, uh, someone shared something where it said, well, someone in the government said that, you know what I mean? If, uh, 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 if, someone, if someone is speaking to Jesus, that's psychosis. Did you, so did y'all see that? You know what I mean? He said, but, but so, here, so here's the thing. Lock me up and throw away the key. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a crazy as a son of a gun. Jesus talks to me. He walks with me. I talk to him. Come on. He heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, 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 and so, so here's the thing. This must have, this must have just revolutionized uh, uh, Paul's life. He thought he was doing God a service. He thought he was serving Yahweh, but he was actually, you know, coming against God. You know what I mean? And the Bible talks about in John 16, uh, 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 verse 2, it says, you will be expelled out of synagogues, and there's a time coming when those who persecute you will think they're doing a service to God. Those who persecute you will think they're doing a service to God. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is death. Paul found himself fighting against God. He was, he was persecuting Christians. He wasn't persecuting Jesus. So what does this mean? In persecuting the church of Jesus Christ, Jesus is the head. He was persecuting Jesus. When you come against the church, when you mock the church, you're mocking Jesus. You cannot separate the two. Ephesians 1 and 2 talks about the church is the body of Christ. Whatever you do to the least of these, my brothers, you have done it to me. You know what I mean? See, people in Syria, in Iraq that are killing Christians, they think they're doing a service to God. But they're not. They're attacking God. And one day they'll find out. But you know what? Many of these Muslims and Muslim countries, they're having dreams. Like the dreams that are happening to people here. Muslim countries, Jesus is showing up in people's dreams. Come on. Jesus is sending an invite card to church into people's whatever the head thing is that they use. You know what I mean? But, but so God got turban. Is that it? I don't know. But anyway, so I know we got some AGTS students here that would know that. We're Sukanya. What's the name of the, the, the head thing that Muslims wear? Turban? Okay, thank you. Is that it, Mom? My mom's here. Let's give my mom a hand. She just got here on Tuesday. So she's a, she's a care pastor at my brother's church. So we're adopting her as Pastor Carla here. So everyone begin praying and fasting that she'll stay. 
You know what I mean? She's here for four months. We're praying she's going to fall so in love with us that she won't go away. Come on. So, so the Bible says that, that it's hard to, to kick against the goads. And so what was an ox goad? This, is, this message is backed by popular demand. This is, uh, this is an ox goad right here. You know, and so what an ox goad was, and there's a, there's a rubber stopper on it, but it was a long pole or stick with a pointed piece fastened to the end of it. And so in the hands of a loving master, the ox could be prodded gently to get going where he, where he needed to go. And, uh, but when a stubborn ox attempts to kick back against the goads, you know what I mean, against the will of God, that would actually inflict discomfort, inflict pain upon him when he tried to resist it. So, so Saul, in his ignorance and unbelief, was kicking against the goads. He was kicking against the will of God. But you know what? When he saw Stephen get martyred and the way that Stephen died, and his face, it says his face became like an angel, and he looked up and said, I see heaven opened up, and Jesus standing at the right hand of the throne of God. When he said, when, when, when Stephen said, forgive them, for they know not what they do, well, there was an ox goad. Just, 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 just getting Paul real good. When, when they said, when, when he saw the miracles that followed the preaching of the word of Jesus Christ, it was an ox goat. There was a conviction of the Holy Spirit that was coming upon Paul. Come on. No one needs to tell. You know what? When you feel conviction, when you feel bad that you're not living the way you should, that's the ox goat. Huh? God, is move, God is moving upon your life. Can you bring this down, Jason? Bring this down here. And so, you know what? Hey, hey, how about when you're, how about when, uh, uh, sometimes you don't need no one to tell you you're doing wrong. You just know you're doing wrong. And that's the Holy Spirit. You know what I mean, huh? When you're, when you're, sitting, in, when you're sitting at that club, huh, with, 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 uh, uh, on, on your sixth or seventh drink, huh? You know you shouldn't be there. Come on, somebody. When you're, when you're, when you're at that house on Friday night, Huh, where, there's, where they're puffing on bubbles and you know Friday night fire's going on and you begin to get convicted and you pull out your iPhone and you're watching Friday night fire while everyone else around you is smoking a bubble. You know what I mean? This, this young man got scared. I'm very good with this thing. I won't, I won't hurt you. I'm a professional. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God is prodding you. That's a good thing. It's a good thing that you feel conviction. You know what I mean? When you're hanging out at the house with that person of the, uh, uh, by yourself and you know you shouldn't be. The conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know what I mean? The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 12, it says a wise man sees danger and avoids it. But a fool keeps going and is destroyed. A fool keeps going even though he sees the danger and he is destroyed. If you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that's good. If you no longer feel it, pray that you would feel it again. If you no longer feel any remorse for your sin, if you no longer feel any remorse for the way you've been living, then you need to repent and you need to ask God to come back into your life and to renew that conviction because that's what's going to keep you on the, on the narrow path. Come on. You know what I remember years ago? You know what I mean? In the 90s, I kept dropping, I kept dropping dirty UAs. Come on, somebody. They would send me to a rehab in Wickenburg, Arizona. And I went to this, and it was an expensive rehab. And I was there. It was called uh, the Meadows. And so I went to the Meadows, uh, and, and on the way there, I drank on that plane. When I got there, I went in 30 days, very expensive rehab, got out, got to the airport, started drinking again at the airport, just got out of a rehab. They just dropped me out of the van from the rehab. I went in and was buying alcohol at the airport. I got home, I got I got back to Albuquerque, back to Albuquerque that night and started using that night. I shot up dope that night. I even got a DWI that night. Man. And so what happened was I ended up going to a teen challenge. This is about 1995 or 1996. I went to a teen challenge in Spokane, Washington. You know what? I, and, and it was actually a pig farm, so we worked with pigs every day. You know what I mean? It was hard work. I never, wa I never worked that hard in my life. So any pig farmers in here, lots of props. 
You know what I mean? I'm, I, all, I, all I used to do was sit on the couch and sell dope out the window. Come on, somebody. You know what I mean? They had me working with pigs, cleaning. Oh, it was horrible. So I went there, and I only lasted like a month and a half, and I got kicked out, and I was, I was at the... Uh, I was, I, was at the, I was at the airport, and they, they had already called my PO, so I'm trying to be sly. Then all of a sudden, I see, like, cops, like, walking back and forth. I'm like, I'm not getting on this plane. <laughs> and so they ended up getting me. I'm in Spokane County Jail, spent months in Spokane County. Now, you guys know I'm half Mexican, and I used to be part of a Mexican gang. But when I walk into the Spokane County Jail, we're talking 99.5% white. So I walked in there like, what's up, brothers? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what's up? You know what I mean? So, hey, I know how to, I know how to roll. I'm a survive. I know how to survive. When I walk into when I walk into L.A. County Jail, que onda raza? Come on, que onda raza? Su trece por vida. Come on. But but you but 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 anyway, so I'm I'm right there, and and I end up getting sent back to Albuquerque. But at that team challenge, man, I was only there for like a month and a half. But I was exposed, man, to the presence of God. And so I got back to Albuquerque, and, I, and, and I'm not kidding you. The Lord's hand was heavy upon me. You know what I mean? I remember driving down in my old hood in southeast Albuquerque on, 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 on coal. It's a one-way, and it goes right into this street called Yale. And on Yale Street is where we used to sell rock cocaine back in the days to people that would drive by. And so I'm, I'm driving down this road, and I end up seeing three cars in front of me with, with uh, 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 Jesus bumper stickers. A fish, Jesus saves, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, what in the world's going on? And I'm feeling this conviction, you know, like the Lord's hand was heavy upon me. I felt the ox goad began to go into my side. And, and then I came, I, came, I came up to let and yell, and I, and I saw a billboard that I had seen many years. This is my hood. I've seen this billboard for many years. But I looked up, and it was a picture of Jesus with his arms wide open that the Catholic Church had put up there years ago. But I looked up, and at that moment, man, God's hand was so heavy upon me. I began trembling in the car, and I ended up going a little bit further and pulling over. And I'm talking, I was shaking. I couldn't even drive. And I pulled the car over, and I said, Dear God, if this is you, leave me alone. said, leave me alone. I don't want it. And you know what? The conviction, weeks, months, the conviction went away. I went back to my old life. I didn't even know if God existed. That's a fact. But you know what? God was always there. Yeah. Convicting me. Trying to bring me back on the right path. Maybe you're here today and you've been kicking against the goats. You, you haven't been all in. You haven't surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here today and you came because you got an invite card. How many got an invite card yesterday by street evangelism and that's why you're here today? Anybody? So a few people. Yeah, here's a few people. Come on, come on. Maybe you've watched us on Facebook and you showed up today like Michelle used to watch us for six months, even though she was snorting, uh, snorting heroin and puffing on a bubble, but watching church and God was, and the, and, and the Lord was prodding her. You know what I mean? She would watch and she would amen, amen Pastor John, and she would, uh, and she would worship with City Reach Church, and then she ended, she ended, she ended up coming you know what I mean, to our, to, our, to our service and encountering Jesus Christ. Now her whole family is here. Where's Michelle at? Stand up, Michelle. Stand up, her family. Where's her family at? Come on. All her family is here in church today. Come on. And Grace, Grace and her two kids were dedicated today. Grace was baptized in water a couple weeks ago. Her whole family... and. That, they weren't living for Jesus. Can I get a witness from the, from the family? Were you guys living for Jesus, Grace? No. They weren't living for Jesus. But now you are. These girls, and they were all in the streets yesterday, handing out flyers, inviting other people to church. Maybe you're here today. And God, and God, the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the ox goat of God is drawing you to him. Here, 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 in a, here in a few minutes and even before then, man, the presence of God is going to fill this house. The conviction of sin 
The spirit of repentance is going to fill this house. And when we call this altar call, people are going to begin to weep and they're going to begin to break down under the power of God because of his mercy. Because he loves you so much that he won't give up upon you. He'll keep guarding you. He'll send the ox goat after you. He'll send the conviction of sin. He'll send a spirit of repentance upon your life to get you to him, to live the plan that he has for your life. Come on. If you believe that, I wish you would stand up and shout for about 10 seconds. And come on. Come on. Come on. Hey! Come on. Come on. Come on. Thank you, God. You may be seated in the presence of Jesus if you can. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, watch this. Watch this. He said, so he trembling and astonished, this is Paul. He said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And this shows a complete change in Paul's attitude, that, that he wanted to follow God. This is an evidence of genuine repentance. But listen to me. This is a far cry from some Western Christianity. Many times in the Western church, we don't ask Jesus, what can, you, what can I do for you? Many times we ask Jesus, what can you do for me? Church, what can you do for me? Not, not, not Jesus, what can I do for you? Huh? Pastor, what can you do for me? Not Jesus, what can I do for you? We've lost sight of what real Christianity is about. It's not about you. Tap your neighbor and say it's not about you. We live in a world in this society where our lives are consumed with our careers, with our hobbies, with our families, and to hell with everybody else. That's the way we live our lives. But you know what? In, in, in the United States of America, and this was, in, this was coined in a book uh, a, a few years ago, but it talks about moral therapeutic deism. And this is actually what most people who are confessing Christians believe in our society. Moral th therapeutic deism basically says that I can do whatever I want. I live my life. I'm a pretty good person. I live my life however I want. And, when I, and if I get into trouble, I call on God, he saves me, and then I go back to living my life however I want. You know what I mean? That's moral therapeutic deism. And then you believe that when I die, I go to, I go to heaven. Isn't it, isn't it a wonderful life? But let me tell you something, friend. That's a far cry from the, from the gospel that I read in, 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 the, book, in the book. That, that's a far cry from, from the Jesus that these disciples were following. Most of them followed him to, to death that Jesus died. Man, man, that, that they weren't afraid to die. They were, they were going all in for Jesus. And that's what I believe God is raising up in this house. I believe he's raising up some people who aren't afraid to die, who have already died. Come on. I've been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. That's why we got some people that are walking the streets of Zone 1, and we got a report that someone even got a gun pulled out on them. Someone even got a gun pulled out on them. Well, what are you doing, Pastor? You're going you're gonna to let these people go out there and get guns pulled on them? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, abs absolutely. The, uh, that, what better way to die than inviting somebody to church? What better way to die than them being out in the streets, in the front line of the battle? Let me tell you something. People are dying across the world for the cause of Jesus Christ. There are some countries where if you just, if you just receive Jesus, your family cuts you off and your family will kill you. That's true. David Evans was talking about it on Friday. Right now, we have, right now at this time in history, there are more martyrs than any other time throughout history. People are dying for the cause of Jesus Christ. But you're afraid to go evangelize because somebody might pull a gun on you. Y'all weren't crazy to walk into them dope house. Oh, come on, somebody. I might just, I don't, you know. Oh, man. You, yeah, you know. You weren't, you, weren't, you, you, you weren't afraid to get so high in a house where you knew you shouldn't be getting that high because there were some crazy folk there, but you got high anyway. Come on, somebody. I don't know about you, but I, here's the thing. I believe God is raising up some people in these last days that have already been through hell and high water. 
Uh, they, we've already been through it. You know what I mean? So we're not going to be intimidated by the culture. I, I've already been stuck. I've already been shot at. I've been locked up. I've had a judge point at me and say, you'll die a long, hard, cold death in prison. I had my family give up on me, except for my beautiful mom who prayed me into the kingdom. Give her a big hand. I'm ready to take this city or die, die trying. How about you? I'm ready to take this region or die trying. Come on. We're not going to back down. We're not going to back down. We got Jesus. Come on. That we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. That's what the Bible says. You know what? There's a, there's a guy by the name of Polycarp. He was the bishop of Smyrna. This is heavy. You know, I just want to share one, one example from church history. But he lived from 69 to 155 A.D. And three days before he was arrested, he was praying. And he had a vision that, his, that, that the pillow he was laying on was on fire. And he told those that were with him, I, I'm going to die. I'm going to be burnt alive. And so what ends up happening as he gets arrested and they're taking Polycarp into the Roman arena, right? And a voice, they said a voice came from heaven and it said, be strong, Polycarp, play the man. No one saw, no one saw who had spoken, but other brothers that were there heard it. Polycarp, play the man. When the crowd heard that Polycarp had been captured, they went into excitement. They went into an uproar. And the proconsul or the governor looked at Polycarp and asked if he was Polycarp. And when he found out that Polycarp said, yes, I am, he looked at him and, and he was an old man. He was 84 years old. And the, the Roman governor, the proconsul said, hey, you know what? Have respect for your old age. Swear allegiance to Caesar and, 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 and down with the atheists of Christianity. You know, and, and, and he goes, and I'll spare you. He's like, you're old, man. You're old. Just live out your life in peace. Just deny Jesus. And, and, and what ended up happening is that, that, that Polycarp said this. He said, 86 years I have served him. And he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? So they grabbed Polycarp. They tied him to a post. They set a fire around him and began to burn him alive. But as the flames went up, Polycarp began to worship Jesus. Uh, according to history, the, the, the flames weren't killing him. The flames weren't killing him. He just continued to worship Jesus as the flames came up around him. And the, and, and, and the angry mob was so upset that they ran up to him and started stabbing him until he died. Jesus was crucified. We're not greater than our master. Let us be willing to die. And you know what? Some of us might be willing to die, but are you willing to live a crucified life? Are you willing to, to die to yourself? Are you willing to die to your lust? Are you willing to die to your addictions? Are you ready to, to die, you know what I mean, to your pride? Are you ready to die to your gossip? Are you ready to die to your self-righteousness? Are you ready to die to yourself that Christ might live through you? That might be harder. Some of us in here are soldiers. We've been soldiers on the streets and soldiers in the pen. It might be easier to take a bullet. It might be easier to go out like that than to wake up every morning and die to ourselves so that we might live for Jesus. Amen. Come on. How many are willing to die to yourselves today? Amen. You know, Paul had tremendous suffering. He talks about it. I faced death. I was in prison. I was whipped times without number. I was beaten with rods. I was stoned. I was in danger. I was hungry. I was shipwrecked. I was betrayed by people who said they were brothers. When we offer the gospel in consumer terms, we try to sell Jesus from a worldly standpoint, and we do a disservice. We try to sell Jesus from a worldly, worldly standpoint, we do him a disservice. You know what I mean? Because Jesus doesn't satisfy the need that you think you have. He satisfies something way more deeper. But you know what? You, you could still be in prison. Paul was in prison rejoicing. He was rejoicing two years, last two years of his life, he was in debt and he was beheaded. But he said, I can do all things through Christ. Whether I have a lot, I know what it's like to have a lot, I know what it's like to have nothing. 
I could do all things through Jesus Christ, even, even sit in this prison and die for the cause of Jesus Christ. Because we know this world is only temporary. If we really believe that, if we really believe that this world is temporary, then we could go through anything here. If we really believe it. If we really believe that people that don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that aren't living out their faith on the daily basis, are going to hell, how many believe that? If you, be if you do believe that, then you will have action. On Saturday at 3.30 when we're hitting the streets, when you, go, when, you, when you go into your workplace, you know what I mean? Be bold for Jesus. You, might, you, you could get fired. Yeah, use wisdom. You, you could get fired, but, but getting fired is the least of your problems. I mean, we got, we got, believers, we got believers in the Middle East that are, that are dying, that are, getting, that are getting raped, getting dumped, dumped in, in, in cages until they drown. You're worried about losing your job? God will provide. Huh? God will provide a way to where you could buy that business. Come on. That the wealth of the richest, riches, uh, the wealth, wealth of the, the, the wicked is stored up for the righteous. You know what I mean? I believe God's going to begin to bless this church, bless the people and the, the business owners in this church and the workers in this church. He's going to begin to give people ideas to start new business so we can go out and, and buy the businesses, buy the property, and then hire whoever we want. Come on. Look at Chick-fil-A. Now it doesn't even open up on Sunday. He got tech to Supreme Court, was losing millions of dollars a day. How many millions? Do you guys remember? Millions of dollars a day he was losing, taken to federal court. He said, we're not going to compromise our Christian values. I'm sorry. And they're closed on Sunday, and they still make more money than almost any other fast food chain. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid to stand for Christ in the midst of a wicked generation. Come on, somebody. We can do all things through Jesus Christ who loves us. I love Paul because you couldn't, you couldn't intimidate Paul. If you said, Paul, we're going to kill you, he'd say, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Huh? If you told Paul, we'll let you live, but we're going to keep you locked up and make you suffer, then he would say, I consider the present sufferings of this age not worth any comparison to the glory that shall be revealed in us. That on the other side of this, there's so much glory awaiting me that it doesn't matter what we suffer. See, Jesus did not go to the cross so you could live a comfortable life. He didn't go to the cross so you could, you could come to church on Sunday and patty cake and give someone a high five and then walk out these doors every, every Sunday and go back to living your life for yourself. Go back to living this life the same way you always did. You know, and, 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 and so I, I'm, I'm just believing, you know, that, that God's going to begin, that we're going to be a people. No, so no one, no one thinks that a church started by an ex-convict dopehead, you know what I mean, is going to make it. No, nobody, nobody thinks that a, that a church that's, that's reaching out, you know what I mean, not only but in part. You know what I mean? To marginalized groups, to the, the, this neighborhood, to ex-addicts, to ex-convicts, huh? You know what I mean? To, to, to ex-dope heads. They don't think we can be self-supportive. How many know we're going to prove them wrong? That we're going to just... Come on. We're going to raise... We're going to teach people how to tithe. We're going to teach people how to give. And people that have gotten saved through this ministry are going to rise up and begin to start businesses. They're going to begin to hire the other people that come into church. And this, this ministry will be self-supportive. Not only self-supportive, but you know what? That we will be the lender and not the borrower. Come on. Can I get a witness, Tim? Come on. Success is not living the American dream, but living God's dream for your life. Uh, and I say this all the time, but the American dream is to make much of yourself. God's dream is to make much of Jesus. Come on, somebody. Tim is starting that African, African, come on. That's the African tradition. This mighty persecutor of the church that was going to Damascus to lock the Christians up, gets encountered by Christ, and now he's led by the hand into Damascus. So he was showing up with his henchmen, riding their horses, locking Christians up. God gets a hold of him, and what ends up happening is he's led into hand blind. Just encounter God. 
You know what I mean? He goes to this house, and this guy named Ananias comes and prays for him, and that he might receive the Holy Spirit, that he might be healed of his blindness. And Ananias, you know, the Lord had told Ananias, I will show Paul how much he will have to suffer for my name. And then Paul gets up, and he goes into the synagogues. But instead of going to the synagogues to lock up Christians, he goes in to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He goes into the synagogues proving from Scripture that Jesus is is the Messiah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let me put, put this back up there for me, Jason. And let me, yeah, let me see that for you. So as the worship team begins to, begins to come up, and, and, and I just have three, three, four, four brief points. They were five. They turned into four. Number one, it's hard to kick against the goads. I believe the Holy Spirit is calling people to him. That just like that ox goad was prodding Saul, you know what I mean? That it was useless for him to kick against the will of God. God's, when you're in this house today, maybe God's calling you to do something deeper than you've ever done. He's causing you to sell out on a different level. You know what I mean? To give your all to him. Number two, share your testimony. Three times, three times in, in, in the book of Acts, we see that Paul, when he was backed up against the wall, he just began to share his testimony. He be, when he was being mobbed, when he was, be, you know, being sentenced to death, you know what I mean? In front of the kings, shared his testimony. When a mob was trying to kill him, he shared his testimony testimony. And then and number three, what do you want me to do, Lord? This should be the response to someone who hasn't had a, a genuine encounter with Jesus Christ. Not what can you do for me, but what can I do for you? Number four, only the Lord can take the worst sinner and make him a bold witness. Paul went from a persecrate, persecutor to a propagator. Uh, the propagator of the gospel. He was the greatest enemy of the church, but God turned it around and he ended up writing more than half of the New Testament books, some of them from prison. You know, he went from Christian killer to church planner. Come on, somebody. He went from madman to urban missionary. He went from dope dealer to hope dealer. He's taken people from prostitutes to faithful and loving mothers and faithful wives. God is still meeting helpless, hopeless, hateful, addicted people. God is still reaching treasures out of darkness and raising them up to do great things for him. God is still reaching unlikely people in overlooked places to do extra ordinary things. God is raising us up because when he uses people like us, he alone gets the glory, Chantel. When he uses people like me and you, he alone gets the glory. God is raising us up. This is not the time to back down. This is the time to go forward. This is the year of expansion. This is the year to be in the streets. This is the year to take the church to the street. Come on, somebody. Let's go ahead and dim those lights today. And this is what I want, this is what I want to do. We give people an opportunity, and you may be seated for a few minutes, but this is what we do. We want to, we, every, every service, we want to give people an opportunity to respond to the grace of God. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Paul said, my preaching was not with eloquent words and man's wisdom, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might be based on God's power, not man's wisdom. The presence of God is filling this house, right? I don't want no one else leaving. Shut those doors. Usher, stand in front of the doors. No one else needs to be leaving right now. Just fo focus upon the Lord right now. So, here, so here's the thing. You're here today, and, and, and there's an ox goad. There's the conviction of sin. You know what I mean? A spirit of repentance is, ru is running through your life, through, through that ox goad, and that's, that's the grace of God. You know, I don't know, I don't know where, where you're at today. And many of you had heard my story. But in 1998, on the run for attempted murder from Albuquerque, I went to Phoenix, Arizona, and, and I was strung out on heroin. And, and I went into a little recovery home. I was headed to Mexico. But I saw this little recovery home where I'd heard of people who had gotten clean. 
I had heard that people stayed out of prison. Much like it is, that's what our hope homes are based off of. That you know what I mean? That people have another option, and it's Jesus. Come on. And so I went into that little recovery home. My intention was not to get a hold of Jesus. My intention was to get off the drugs so I could stay on the run. But I was there, and Jesus encountered me. He, he, he got me to a place where I had no place else to look but up. And I said, Jesus, come into my life. And, and, and he filled me with his spirit. He gave me a, a peace, and he gave me purpose. For the first time in my life, I had real peace. I never had peace. I didn't trust nobody. I didn't trust nobody, and the cops less. Come on, somebody. I didn't trust nobody, but for the first time in my life, I had peace. You know what I mean? And for the first time in my life, I had purpose. My life had purpose. Let me tell you something today, friend. Your life has purpose. Your life has purpose. God has a plan for your life. He wants to raise you up. He, before the foundations of this world, before you were in your mother's womb, he had a plan for your life. You're not a mistake. God has a plan for your life. But I ended up being in that recovery home. Then I graduated the recovery home just like Jackie did today. And then I ran the recovery home for another year. Then I went to the school ministry in L.A., graduated the school ministry and went to Manila, the Philippines, planted churches, started recovery homes, full-blown revival over there. God was moving. And then after two years over there, we came back into L.A., and I was arrested on those old charges. Right at LAX, back in LA County Jail, back at the Glass Towers, facing 20 plus years in prison. And they extradited me back to Albuquerque and, and, I, and I got out to fight the charges. And during that season, you know, I, I got very discouraged. I never blamed God, but I was discouraged. I'm facing all this time. And you know what? Lamentably, I started drinking margaritas on lunch break. And then I started shooting heroin. And then I started shooting rock. Shooting, shooting, uh, doing speedballs, cocaine, and heroin again. I ended up going on the run. And you know, I was staying at little cheap hotels, the De Anza on Central Avenue in Albuquerque, New Mexico, selling dope in the alley. And I mean, in that little, in that little hotel room, I can see myself there today. I would see little demons running around me, laughing at me with voices of little children. I was being tormented. I thought I had gone crazy. I was seeing stuff. I was hearing stuff. And, and, and you know what? There was a voice in the back of my head that said, why don't you kill yourself? And I would get a 45 Ruger, and I would put it to my head, and, and I would want to blow my head off. And there was a voice in the back of my head that said, pull that trigger. Your life's a waste. You don't even know your daughter, Ashley. You, you, you let everybody down. You let everybody down that cares about you. You can't even be loyal to your God. You're a hopeless junkie. Why don't you do this world a favor and pull that trigger? This close. Over and over again, this close. A few months later, I was picked up. And I was sent to prison. I was sentenced to eight years by the grace of God. I got to prison. I'm doing the same thing. Just selling drugs. Jesus didn't exist in, in my reality. I had memories of him existing and things he had done. But in my current reality, I was the, the Bible says our sin separates us from God. My sin had separated me that even though I was a, I was a church planner, I started recovery homes. But I didn't even know if this thing was real or I had lost my faith. And you know what? I went into, I ended up getting busted for suspicion of bringing narcotics into the facility. And they sent me to the level five at Santa Fe, New Mexico. That was the site of the worst prison riots in the history of the United States. Right there and looking out over the old camp where those prison riots were. Right there, you know what I mean? I got down on my knees. And I said, Jesus, I'm talking, I had lost everything again. I was broken, busted, and disgusted. And I got down on my knees and I said, Jesus, if you're still there, would you come back? I don't want to do anything great for you. I don't want to preach. I don't want to do this. I just need that peace. I just need your presence in my life like I once had. And do you know that the presence of God filled that place? And it was like waves of electric liquid that flowed over me for five months. My prison became a palace. Man, my dungeon was filled with light. And God began to show me pictures of me preaching again. 
He began to show me pictures of me preaching in stadiums, of me preaching in prisons, of me preaching in churches. He began to show me visions of, of you guys right there and me right here when I was in a lonely prison cell in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I said, God, I said, you got the wrong guy. I said, I'm not faithful. I said, God, Paul said that he was the worst of sinners, but he acted in ignorance. I acted in full knowledge. So what does that make me? I knew you were real, and I turned my back on you. What does that make me if Paul's the worst? But he acted in ignorance. I said, God, I don't want to do these things that you're showing me. I had no, I had no uh, uh, self-worth, man. You know what I mean? I didn't think I could do it. I was hopeless. And God began to speak to me, and he spoke to me from Matthew chapter 20 and verse 15 from the parable of the 11th hour workers. And he said this, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own things? And I said, yes, God, you're God, and I'm not. And I submitted to the will of God. I got out of solitary confinement. I was voted in an inmate pastor, and this church, the chapel began to fill up. Lives were getting transformed. I started taking Bible school courses through Global University. In two, and then I got out and did my parole. In 2011, God called me to come to this city. I met my beautiful wife, Hannah, and we stayed here to plant this church. We know that God has called us here. We know that... And, and let, let, let me just serve the devil notice that we ain't going nowhere. We're still standing. We're still here. We're going forward with everything that God has called us to do in this city. And he's going to do above and beyond all we can ask or even imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Come on. So maybe you're in this house today and maybe you walked in here and this is your first time here. You know what I mean? I, but, but, but you don't know Jesus. And I'm not talking about knowing about Jesus. I'm talking about do you know him intimately? Do you know him? Do you know him personally? You see, the Bible says in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, it says, enter through the narrow gate. Come on. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. Many find it, but small is the gate. Narrow the path that leads to life, and only a few find it. There's a, there's a broad path that you can walk down, even in the church house, even with some of this greasy gospel that we got people talking, talking about nowadays. But, but the Bible goes on in Matthew, and Jesus goes on, and, and he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, Huh? Well, we'll enter the kingdom of God, but only he who does the will of my Father. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we prophesy? Didn't we do this? And he'll say to them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, because I never knew you. That know you is to know you by experience. Jesus said, those who love me obey my commandments. So there's a portion of this where you come to Jesus and you receive him, but then you got to get discipled. You got to go to Tim, Pastor Tim's discipleship class. You got to get into a reach group. Man, your life will begin to change, but it's not it's not a religious works thing where you're trying to change your outward life to to to, to please God, but God changes our heart. God changes our heart that we don't want to do that stuff that we used to do. We don't want to sell crack on Yale Street no more. Huh? We don't want to rob people no more or whatever your thing is. We don't want to live in immorality. We don't want to go clubbing no more. We don't want to cuss no more. We don't want to do the thing. We don't want to be self-righteous no more. There's someone watching right now. You suffer with self-righteousness. You think you're all that in a bag of chips. But as, we've been, as this message has come forth today, God's been convicted you of self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is the ugliest of sins. You think you got it all under control. That's what the religious leaders had. They thought they were good. Some people, maybe someone came to this church and you're here to help other people, these, these poor drug addicts. But guess what? God brought you here to get a hold of your life. To get your heart right. To get your heart right. It's not about you. It's not about you. And, no, and Jesus said, you know, whoever wants to be my disciple must pick up the cross and follow me and die daily. So you're here today, and, I'll, and I want to encourage you. I know we're in the Bible Belt, so everybody knows a lot about Jesus. But I want to ask you today, do you know him personally? Do you walk with him? Do you live for him? Do you eat Jesus? Do you breathe Jesus? Is he the air that you breathe? And, 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 and so, so there's a difference between knowing about him and knowing him. But then maybe you're here today. 
And like me in that lonely prison cell, maybe one time you were living for Jesus. You were, do, you were uh, serving God with all of your heart, but you're not right now. And, 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 if, and if the arrows of God would, would, would flow across this place and he, and he would penetrate hearts, and right now the Holy Spirit is bringing to your mind those things in your life that ain't right. But at one time you were. One time you were living for him, but you want to rededicate your life to him. So this is what I want to do. I don't want to belabor this anymore, but this is what we're going to do. I'm going to count to three with every head bowed and every eye closed. It, 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 it's, and the presence of God is going to flow through this place right now. Holy Spirit, we give you liberty in this house right now. Lord, we pray for a spirit of conviction of sins. God, Lord, for a spirit of repentance. God, begin to remove the stony hearts and give hearts of flesh even now. Right now, you're here today, and you've never had an encounter with Jesus. You know about him, but you've, these things like I'm talking, you have, this is completely foreign to you. You've never had an encounter with Jesus. Then I want to say today is your day. Or you're here today, and at one time you were living for Jesus, but you're not living for him anymore. Today is your day. So I'm going to count to three, and when I do, I just want you to raise your hand from all over this room if you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ today. One. You want to get right with God. Two, that's the presence of God moving in your heart. You want to surrender to Jesus today. Three, from all over this place, lift your hands. You want to get right with God. You want to surrender to Jesus. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. How many more? Ten, eleven. I see about eleven hands. Twelve, twelve. Come on. Anybody, 13 in the back. So I, I can't, I don't have my glasses on either. But this is what I want you to do. I want you to come forward if you raise your hand. I want you to be very bold and come and put your feet up against this altar. Let's give them a big hand today. Come on. Come on. Come on. There's room. Put your feet up against the altar. If you're answering it, put your feet up against the altar. All of, come on. Come on, there's more room down here. There's more room down here. Put your feet up against the altar. Put your feet up against the altar. You want to surrender to Jesus. This is beautiful. This is what it's all about. This is what it's all about. There's someone else in this house. You need to come forward. You need to come forward. God, the the God, the God, the ox goat of God is touching your heart. You need to come forward. Come on down. Put your feet up against this altar. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Come on. This is what I want you to do. If you're at this altar, I want you to raise your hands and begin to worship Jesus. Just say, Jesus, forgive me with your own words. Say, then we'll pray here in a little bit. But just say, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me. I need a new life. And we're going to begin to worship right now. Just raise your hands. Say, Jesus, I need you. Forgive me. Hallelujah. In your own words, just tell them, forgive me, Jesus. Say, forgive me, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. You're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. Sing.
to want to do it. That's amazing. God can not only cause you to do his will, but to make you fall in love with doing his will. That's powerful right there. I'm telling you, I just used to care about me, myself, and I. There's no way I would want to give my life for other people, but God changed my heart, and now I love what I do, and God's going to do that in your life, and each one of you, he's got a purpose, and he's got a plan, and I want you to get plugged in in this church and to get discipled. We're going to walk with you. We're not going to let you say a little prayer and then walk out. We want you to get plugged in. We want to do life with you. We want to disciple you. We want to tell you about Jesus and show you how to live for him. So this is what I want to do. Just say this prayer after me, but believe it with all of your heart. We could do this in English or Spanish. Podemos hacer esto en español si queremos, because it's not the, the word, it's not a magic formula, but it's about the cry of your heart to the living God. Let's say, say this prayer with me, y'all. Say, dear Jesus, everybody in the house, dear Jesus, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I believe you're the Son of God, came to this earth, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and then died on the cross for my sin, for my sin, and then you resurrected, you're now at the right hand of the Father, and then you poured out your spirit, fill me with your spirit, fill me with a hunger for your word. I pray today that I'll never be the same. Give me a new heart. Make me new. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. God bless you. I bless you. Come on. If you answered the altar call, follow Pastor David. Follow Pastor David. We want to give you a Bible. We want to tell you what your next steps are. We want to tell you how you can get plugged in at this church. We want to walk with you. So if you answered this altar call, if you would please... Walk this way towards Pastor David. We got, we got a, a good one. We got a good celebration song. Huh? Oh, 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 oh. Right. So hey, right now, right now we're gonna. So so for the rest of us, I know I know it's on, I know it's getting late, and we want to beat the Methodist to church. I mean to to lunch. But right now, you know what I mean is it, it, is we're gonna we're gonna go ahead we're gonna go ahead and, and and close out close out this service. You know what I mean? But we're gonna close out with a celebration song. How many want to celebrate today? Come on. You know what? Here's here's the thing, man. We may you may you may you may come across struggles. You may come against trials and temptations. But this is what you need to know today: that there are more that are with us than that there are against us. That the armies of God are greater. That greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. So we bless you today. Pray the Lord would bless you. I pray that the Lord would protect you. That He would cause His face to smile upon you. That He would be gracious to you. Then may the Lord show you his favor and may he give you his peace. Let's close out with a celebration song right now. This is how I fight my battles. Come on. This is how I fight my battles. Come on. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. Hey. I'm in like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. surrounded by you. Sing it again. Say, I may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Hey, I might look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is all. 
I'm surrounded by you. God bless you. Thank you so much.